The next wave came along, I remember 70s when the calculators came, became affordable. The first calculator, I bought it in America, and that was Texas Instrument Calculator, actually, sort of, you know. And then the calculator, but, but the interesting part that I want to show you is the one on the top. That's a mechanical calculator using cylinders and pulleys and, you know, registers and things like that. So the origin of calculators is almost more than 100 years back. And then you will find that when you go to a restaurant or you go to some shop, you will find that there's a calculator with a dot matrix printer. So you get a receipt which is uh, available to you. So printing along with computation is also very important. This is because so many variety of output devices will come into our discussion. So I wanted to show you the first device where computing as well as printing was becoming very important. If 5 plus 4 is 9, you want to print it out. 5 plus 4 equal to 9. How do you print it? How do you connect that printer to your computing device is a very important part. We will discuss it in due course of time. The middle picture is also a very important. I want you to, I mean, if you ask me, I want you to build your computer. I want you to design a very special kind of a computer. You can do that. And if you see the device, at the back of it, you will find electronics which is very similar to what you see at the back of a calculator. Okay. This particular chip is the main processor and the rest of it is very standard electronic elements, components. So if you have got electronic components, if you can design this, you can fabricate your own computer. And this is what the confidence one should have after going through courses and getting a degree in engineering, as a part of your engineering training, actually. And the one on the right-hand side is the programmable, very famous HP calculator, you know. This is the most, the first programmable calculator. The programmability in a calculator was a very big novelty that you can, oh, you can write a code and store it in the calculator. That program can be invoked many times in a calculator. It was a novelty in 70s. And this particular machine became very popular, which was called as the HP 65 calculator. So that is another movement forward. Now I want to tell you how I did in engineering college. When we were studying computer programming, the way the program will be written, for every line in the program, there will be a card. And on that card, if I say i is equal to 1 plus 4, so for i there will be one column, for equal to there is another column, and the combination of the holes will indicate what is that character, including the special characters and numerals, etc., etc. So each card will represent one line of a code. Now, once so you, at home you write the program, then you go to the unit record room. This room is called as a unit record room. And this machine is called as a punching machine, the one you see on the left hand side. IBM machines were there. And what you do is you put the deck of cards, plain cards there. And then you press the keyboard and you will find that car will come, then it will go down, and whatever you have typed, that whole thing will get punched. So if you see your card, you will see those punched characters. And if you are offset even by a fraction of a millimeter, you will find, or a fraction of a centimeter, you will find that the program is bombed out. So first you punch these cards, then at 8 o'clock in the morning you go to computer center, hand it over to them. So all the 100 students will hand over those deck of cards. They will be collected, they will be read through a reader, another hopper will be there, Brrr, all the cards will be read. A tape will be created, it's called as batch processing. And through that tape, that will be put as input tape, then each program is processed, the output of the program will be put on another tape, and that will be printed out, there will be a line printer, and the sheets will be available to us at 4 o'clock in the evening. And if you have just i equal to 1 comma 4, and if you have missed comma, the whole day is gone. And nowadays you have got that backspace and people write the programs by editing it God knows how many times, some sort of, you know. So this freedom was not available to us. And that machine is called as a unit record printing machine. The cards, we used to have these cards, tons of cards actually. You know? So if you want to write a program, you must have the deck of cards. And you will find that there used to be a room like the one which I have shown it on the right hand side. There will be a big room, there will be all these unit record machines. And we will go there, grab the machine, put deck of cards and then start 
punching it, whatever the punched cards will come, go to another room, give it to the operator who is there. The operator will give you a receipt saying that your number is 34 or 44 or whatever. Then the, all the decks will be put together, come at 4 o'clock in the evening, you go at 4 o'clock and you see some silly mistake and the whole day is gone. So we were very, very careful programmers, not like the careless programmers nowadays we have. And by the way, the program is an extremely, extremely inflexible uh, document. If you do a small mistake, you, your program will not give you the answer. It's like a dumbest of the dumb servant that you may have. And the servant will do exactly what you have said. And if you have said something wrong, the servant will do something wrong, actually. So that is the way the computer programs were done in my good old young days, actually. The, we still remember them and it's very important for you to understand that these machines were the forerunners of the computers that you are using today. Now the first one, the one on the right hand side that I am showing here is called as the ENIAC, uh, UNIVAC computer, I'm sorry. So now the scene shifted from Europe to Americas. And at the Princeton University, at uh, Harvard University, at uh, UPenn, the University of Pennsylvania, and in Chicago, people started building electrical or electronic devices using the walls. In those days, transistors were still not available. So using the walls, people started building the digital logic. And what they did was that if you want, a, so wiring was done at the back end. I will show you very quickly. And then if you want to change the program, you change the wiring actually. And then the new program will be done. So the program was hard-coded wiring connection. Now this machine that you see over here is the UNIVAC machine. And for the first time in the history of United States, the, the news channel CBS uh, announced the results of the presidential election through using the computer. Earlier they used to take four or five days to announce the results. That day they could announce it within six hours. And nowadays you announce it within two hours. The trends are available in two hours and the results are available in four hours. So people felt that, oh, this is a wonderful machine that can make you announce the election results very fast. Walter Cronkite, who was a very famous news reader, he acknowledged it and then the rest is history actually. What you see on the right hand side is the machine, there is a, a mercury based uh, devices used for storing the data. So the data storage was done through mercury tubes and the digital electronics was done through the valves in those machines. And at the back end, as I said, the wiring has to be changed. You can see the complex wiring. And if you look at these computers, they are far less powerful than even the tablet that you use or the laptop that you use. Your laptop is 10 times better than these machines that I'm showing you here. It was that primitive a situation that just to get some calculations done, the, these kinds of humongous machines were built in those days actually. But that is the ingenuity, that is the creativity, that is the spirit that has led to what you see today. If you don't do this, you don't get this also. Another scene, you can imagine how much is the back end electronic wiring actually, sort of, you know. So this is the, and, and as I told you, after all this, the capability is one tenth your laptop, you know. So that was the kind of situation one had, but things changed so dramatically. There's a Moore's law which says that the electronic speeds drops after every, it drops to half after every 18 months. So uh, this I don't have to explain. <laughs> So I guess uh, that is what I wanted to explain to you today, just to give you a bird's eye view of how we are now approaching this course, what is the background, why we want to study, the, what is the role of a language, what kind of machines, uh, you know, there was a movie called Those, ma those fl Magnificent Machines, Those Flying Men in Their Magnificent Machines. Very interesting of the aircrafts, how the old aircrafts were there, people, how they tried, and how today's aircraft has come about. So it's always interesting to see the evolution of technology. What you study as technology today has not come all of a sudden. It has evolved. And that spirit of evolution is very important. Unless you do something today, unless you tinker about it something today, tomorrow is not going to be better for you. And just importing something will not work. So I want you to design your own devices. I want you to design your own machines. I want you to be an innovator 
yourself okay thank you